Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Derek Elliott from Dirk.com and today we are going to be making this. So yeah, kind of cool sort of luxurious wine animation here and if you didn't catch it the whole thing is of course a blender pun made possible by none other than Kieran Black, an actual wine label designer living in Denmark, but he's from Australia where many good blender things we know come from. Um, so I'll tell you more about Kieran and the label in a minute, but just want to quickly make note of a few things and kind of walk you through what we're going to be doing. First note is that this YouTube video is actually only covering the first half of the project. We'll kind of get up to the point of creating a nice still render of the wine bottle. I know you're probably thinking, you know, wow, two hours is crazy long but believe me when I tell you uh, that'll only get us halfway there and the whole thing is over double that so the next part is going to be coming in a separate YouTube video but because it did end up being so long and because I love you so much I have released the entire course on my website at courses.dirk.com for you to follow in a more appropriate format kind of allows you to better track your progress hide some of those pesky ads and focus on getting top-notch blender knowledge in your head as fast and as efficiently as possible. So that's uh, that's totally available right now if you want to go ahead and dive into that. Just need a little more time to wrap up the uh, second half of the YouTube editing. So that video will come out, but the whole thing is available now on my website, courses.dirk.com. And it's all for a, a very pretty reasonable price, I would say. A uh, price you find very familiar with my content. That price is free, of course. Basically the same as the YouTube video. So the choice is yours, but I just wanted to, you know, give this a shot and I'd be lying if I said there weren't a few extra small bonus sections in there. Um, but for the content itself, uh, we're going to cover everything from the, you know, getting a reference image in there to doing some modeling, uh, adding the label, some textures, some more advanced textures with, you know, spot gloss, things like that. And then, of course, we'll kind of finish with some lighting and the animation. And then in the course format, I actually walk you through even like my After Effects file. So it's all in there. Very thorough, as you can expect from most of my content. You know, with this one, we dive, I would say, even deeper than we normally do. I try to take the time to explain everything that I'm doing in enough detail that, you know, we move along at a good pace but you aren't left feeling um, like something wasn't fully explained. So that all being said, not for total beginners. If you are looking for a challenge or maybe you played with Blender just a little bit, feel free to give it a shot, but I don't cover some really basic stuff like navigating the viewport or like downloading Blender. Some people cover that in a tutorial. <laughs> Probably not gonna see that from me anytime soon. Um, yeah, I expect you to kind of already be familiar with some things like that, but hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoy putting it all together. Let me know here or in, in the comments on my site or on YouTube, wherever you're watching, uh, what you think about it. And yeah, looking forward to jumping in. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about that wine label. So let me tell you all a little story about this here wine label. I have found with a lot of my uh, projects in the past, when I worked with someone who is a professional in their respective field, I end up with a lot better results. Andrew Olson created the sound for my cell phone tutorial. Anastasia created the cosmetics brand for that tutorial. And those projects definitely looked way better than other similar ones that I did all by myself. Uh, so the story is no different here. Kieran Black reached out to me asking if I had considered doing a wine bottle tutorial before. And I actually had, so when he mentioned being interested in designing the label himself, I was certainly all about that. But yeah, Kieran is a graphic designer from Australia, South Australia, and uh, currently lives in Denmark though, where he works as a graphic designer, just designing all sorts of lovely things from wine labels, of course, to full brands for uh, a variety of different businesses. Um, so definitely check out his website. But uh, yeah, I kind of jumped on board with the whole process for Kieran and um, we started sort of by creating a mood board, finding some initial ideas, thinking about what sort of style we wanted to go for. Kieran does some really nice hand-drawn work that we played with, but we ultimately ended up going for something a little bit more minimal and modern. 
I think it was actually Kieran's idea to make the uh, default cube a central theme to the bottle, which I welcomed with open arms, thinking, uh, you know, we probably should honor that poor little fella that gets deleted all the time. So Kieran honestly had a ton of really cool designs, but we ended up going with this sort of gloomy cube fading away into nothingness. The grain has a really nice vintage look to it, but it also hints at uh, like viewport noise in cycles, which, I mean, come on, this is pretty cool. So Kieran also took a look at the, the Dirk brand, of course, taking some inspiration from my box project and ended up incorporating the nice Dirk color as a little pop on the label, which also created a really nice area to do some unique spot gloss effects. Uh, then finally, I wrote a little tidbit to go on the back, which I will read for you now. Time after time, our beloved default cube faces uncertainty in the eyes of a new file blend holder. The X or the tab, to be birthed out of six simple faces, or to face the ultimate demise, deletion, though it may be sad, it is expected, and with this all-too-common scenario coursing through our minds, we drink. For this wine, it is the joy, the inspiration, and the admiration we have for our beloved default cube. In the highest honor of all things blender and all things blended, we've, create, we've created, I do have a typo there, we created this fine blend. Delete or not delete, the choice is yours. But in this moment of merriment, the choice is not so sad. Enjoy its rich flavors, its stories of creation and of death. Hold your friends close and your cubes closer. Developed, designed, and dabbled in the Adelaide, South Australia, with a twist of Austin, Texas. Sorry, Kieran, and I added the uh, Austin, Texas part because that's where I live. But Australia is cool too. I mean, Andrew Price is from there. So yeah, the point of all this is, you know, don't try to do everything by yourself. Work with your friends, make new friends, collaborate, learn about how others work, and yeah, you'll you'll be better for it. So feel free to use this label if you want to just follow along. Uh, you're welcome to do that. But of course, I'm sure many of you will choose to design your own labels, and I can't wait to see what they look like. Okay, so to get started with the modeling process here, first thing we're going to want to do is uh, bring in a reference image. But before we actually do that, I'm just going to do a small amount of housekeeping. This is something I don't actually normally do, if I'm being honest, but um, I want to model this wine bottle to scale. So what I'm going to do first is over here in my Scene Properties tab, I'm going to change the units. Um, I'm going to leave it at metric. So if you're uh, working with inches and feet, you might want to change that to Imperial. But um, for the purposes of this, we're really not going to be messing with the units much, but um, I'm going to leave that at metric. And then for the unit scale, uh, we can leave that there and the length i'll go ahead and change down to um, i think eh, centimeters will be fine uh, and this is just so that uh, if you were to take this model out of this scene and put it in another one you would know it be it would be properly scaled whereas if you didn't do this um, you know it might come in big and you'd have to you know tweak some modifiers or something but again in all honesty i usually skip this step but we're going to try to model to scale here um, so i'm taking my default cube here and then the way I like to get something to scale is to uh, just type in the dimensions right here, which is going to change this scale you scale value. But I know um, from a small amount of research that a wine bottle is about 295 millimeters tall. So I can go ahead and type that in. And what that's going to do is scale that cube to be uh, 29.5 centimeters, which is 295 millimeters. Um, and again, you know, you don't have to be exact with this, but uh, something around there. So now what I can do is, uh, so the, it changed the scale to match that dimension, which is fine, um, but I'm really only interested in the, the height. So when you're working with reference images, you really just need to have one dimension uh, right, and then you can scale everything around that. So I'm going to press S and Shift Z, and I tabbed into edit mode, by the way, and just scale that down to about wine bottle shape. So you can see if we were modeling with our regular cube, the wine bottle would be really big. And uh, in previous tutorials, people have mentioned that uh, my objects are way out of scale, but I'm not too worried about the height and width, just kind of guess on that, or sorry, the you know depth and width, I guess. But uh, the height is right now. Um, the only thing I want to change though is that the grid is now uh, way too big. So up here, I think right here, yeah, I can change the grid scale. I'm just gonna change that down to a 0.1. And that'll just make it so uh, if we're moving things and snapping them, they'll uh, they'll snap to better increments rather than jumping super far. 
Um, so there is just that little bit of housekeeping. Let's go ahead now and bring in our reference image. And I'm actually, just so that I don't get too confused, I'm gonna delete that camera and that lamp. So just left clicking on those to select them and then X to delete them. By the way, you can see I have my screencast keys turned on down here in the bottom left. If you miss anything, of course, let me know uh, if there's something else that I missed. And uh, we'll try to make sure you, you got all your hotkeys down. Hotkeys are a big part of Blender. So with that reference in there, um, I'm going to I'm going to do shift A and then I'm gonna insert an image and then I will do a reference image. And you may not have that images as planes option. Uh, I think that's with an add-on and we will end up using that later. So I'll, I'll be sure to show you how to turn that on. But I'm just gonna go to my textures and then I have these two references I made. Um, I made them for you. Uh, when you look online, you know, a lot of times it's a photo and they're not perfectly flat on the bottom. So I made these references just as a, a little help to you. Uh, if you're watching the course on Teachable, which I hope you are, this is something new I'm trying out, um, those files will be available for download right there. Otherwise, I think the best thing to do is going to be um, to just screenshot them. I'll put them up on the screen. Or of course you can find your own image of a wine bottle online. There's plenty to choose from and you will drive yourself crazy realizing uh, how many slight differences there are between all the shapes and things like that. Um, but you know, use your own, create whatever you want. But these are just two references I put together to maybe make the process a little bit easier. Um, so uh, I just double clicked on the image in the in the browser and then it will bring it in, but it brings it in at this odd angle, which is the angle that uh, you were kind of looking when you brought it in. So the quickest way to get it uh, to the right size is gonna be to press Alt R, which will reset the rotation. Um, so you can see now that's zeroed out. And then I'm just gonna press R, X and type in 90 to flip that up on its side. And then I'm gonna press G and Z just so that it's sitting on the, on the surface there. I just kind of want it to be um, sitting on the edge. So if I go into wireframe, no, that's not helping me much. So I want, I can't actually see my axis line there because this is, uh, it's not see-through. So in the image object data properties down here in this tab on the right side, I can turn on transparency. And I'm gonna turn that pretty far down, down to like a, yeah, something like that will look fine. Um, so if I press one to go in my front view, I can see I've got it pretty close, just gonna move it up a little bit. And then uh, I wanna scale it down to my object. So for one, let's move this object up so that it's sitting right on the plane. So we know that this is our 295 millimeter tall um, box essentially. So now we need to scale this image down. Uh, but if we were pre to press S, um, by default, it would scale into the center like that. But what I'd rather have it do is just scale from that point right there in the middle, which is actually where my 3D cursor is. So I can press period across the bottom of my keyboard and change the uh, pivot point to my 3D cursor. So now when I scale it down, it will scale about that 3D cursor. So we're just gonna bring this down until the tip is right at the top. And again, if you wanna see through, you can press Alt-Z, which will go into your X-ray mode. That toggle is also up here. Um, so just get that about right. And you can see I was pretty close with the, uh, with the width of it, but again, that's not too important. So now that we have our reference image scaled properly, the next thing I'll do is probably just go ahead and delete that cube. So I know that's in the right place. And for the empty, I will now, I need to turn on, I wish some of these were on by default, but restriction toggles, um, this little filter right here, this one will allow you to make an object unselectable. So if I click that, now I can't, uh, I can't select it. So I won't accidentally select it when I'm, um, you know, working on the rest of this wine bottle. So now that my reference image is in place, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the modeling portion of this bottle. So I'm gonna press Shift A and add a mesh. And for that mesh, I will make it a circle, which is gonna add a circle right there. And when you do that, this little window will pop up down here. I think if you accidentally like click out of that window and you lose it, you can press F9 maybe? Yes, F9. And that's gonna bring the options back up, which will allow you to um, adjust things. So. Uh, if you took specific note of how um, the diameter of wine bottle, you could type that in here, but I'm just gonna scale it based on my reference image. So uh, I'm gonna press one to go into my front view, and I'm just gonna press, I wanna make sure I'm in edit mode here. So I want the scale to stay one. So any you know big changes I'm making, I want to happen in edit mode. So tabbing into edit mode, and you can see we're in our vertex select mode. I'm just gonna bring that in. And then again, in the front view, um, just kind of start shaping this out. So pressing S to scale, and then I'm gonna press E and Z and just bring this up. 
somewhere around there. And there's obviously many ways you could do this, like with anything in Blender. Oh, I want to scale it in, but it's scaling on my uh, pivot point. That's the 3D cursor there. So I'm going to press period and change that back to the default, which is median point. So now when I scale that in, it'll scale from the center where I want it to. Um, so like I was saying, there are a number of ways that you could um, go about this in more traditional CAD softwares, which is kind of the background I came from. You would probably, um, you'd know, probably do like a revolve or something like that. And you can do revolves like that in Blender, but um, for this particular model, I think this is the easiest way to do it. So I'm just pressing E and Z just to extrude it and have it go upwards. And then just pressing S to scale in a little bit. And I'm just kind of going along the shape of this bottle to, uh, to shape it out. And that's why the reference image is very helpful. I tried this a few times without a reference image, just kind of like what I thought a wine bottle looked like. And I gotta tell you, it just does not turn out as good when you're doing it from your head. Um, so I'm pressing E, and then when I right click, it'll just snap it to where it is, uh, which means we have doubles right there. But now I can press S to scale that in. And I'm kind of just watching this, this vertex right there. I know that's the edge, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, but then when I go up, and then I'll stop right about there. So again, I don't want to be a, uh, uh, a snob when it comes to wine bottle shapes. There are a lot, and it took me a long time to just decide like what the heck to go with. But um, use your own references. Feel free to uh, change up the shape a little bit. Um, but yeah, in general, we just want kind of an even distribution of geometry up and down there. And that will look pretty good. So I'm pressing Alt and Z to enter in X in my X-ray row x-ray mode. So let's go ahead and do the bottom portion of the bottle here. So I'm going to press tab to go back into edit mode now that I've done a little inspecting. And uh, this part's going to be a little bit different. So I'm going to press, um, let's do E and then S to bring that in. So let me do that again for you just so you know. So I'm pressing E and then a lot of times I just move my mouse to like see that the command has been successful. And then when you right click, that will snap it back to where it was. You can see we still have um, vertexes there, vertices. Gosh, I always get that wrong. I don't even care anymore. And um, and so so I'm right clicking to make sure that it's back in place. And then I press S to scale it in. And then uh, I'm just going to do that. And now Alt C to go back into my X-ray X -ray mode. I'm just going to press E and Z. This is another small advantage to using the Dirk Custom Wine reference images is that I actually did a little model of the punt, I believe this is called. And this is another thing. There's, I was going to try to include as part of the tutorial like a, you know, some history lessons about the punt, but um, yeah, there's all sorts of reasons and things why people think the punt is there. And um, some of them I think actually are legitimate, and I'm sure somebody will tell me in the comments what the punt is for, um, but I'll just, uh, I'll leave it to your own imagination right now. Um, so this is all looking fine, of course. Uh, we don't want these edges, and we don't want this jaggedness. And um, honestly, we want this whole thing to be a lot smoother. So we're going to uh, we're going to want to smooth it out. So I can right click and shade it smooth, which is fine. That works okay. Maybe if this was for like a video or game or something. Uh, but honestly, we want quite a bit more geometry, and that's going to be done with a subdivision surface modifier. So when I add that, it's going to smooth things out quite a bit more. And if we go into our wireframe view here, and we could uncheck optimal display to actually see uh, what's happening with the subdivision surface modifier. But that is that is basically taking the average between all these points that I made and uh, and smoothing them out quite a bit. Now usually you do want to leave that optimal display on though. Uh, when you get into really high poly meshes, uh, a, a very dense geometry it could slow down your viewport a little bit, depending on what type of computer you're working on. Um, but yeah, so typically, you know, you'd want to leave the viewport levels a little bit lower than the render levels, just so everything's a little bit snappier and keep optimal display on. This object is relatively simple though, so I want to keep my uh, viewport and render levels the same, and I'll leave optimal display on. Um, so with what I've got there, it's doing a fine job of smoothing this out. You know, maybe you'd want to make some small adjustments here uh, to to keep it in line with your reference image, but. We're getting a few problems, so we'll first tackle this up here. Uh, you can see it is, it's smoothing that out, which is, uh, you know, I, I kind of want it to smooth like that around here and here, but not up here at the top. So what I need to do, uh, sometimes I would do this with a bevel modifier, but essentially we want to add edge loops so that the, uh, the geometry will be a little bit tighter, um, you know, up on those edges. So I'm going to press Control R to add an edge loop, and then I can just slide that up 
And if you really wanted it to be sharp, you could add like another edge loop right there. Um, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to skip that. Uh, but to tighten this up, I'll add an edge loop here, bring it down, add an edge loop here, bring it up, and then we'll do the same thing here. And that's looking just fine for me. I still want a little bit of roundedness, just the, the way a glass bottle is made. You know, there's, um, you're not going to have super sharp edges. So I think that that looks pretty good like that. Uh, now the bottom is going to be the next part I tackle. So uh, if I tab into edit mode here, you can see we've got a straight line all the way down from the way we modeled it. You know, we were using our Z axis to go straight up. Um, but once this has been subdivided, it's a little bit bulbous, if you will. And when we apply our label, that could be a little bit of a problem. I'll show you how you can kind of tilt the label a little bit. Um, but we want to keep this as straight as possible. So one way to do that would be to add an edge loop here and just bring it up, which you can see is going to keep it pretty straight. You also want one at the bottom. Um, but the problem with that is if you slide this edge loop up a little bit too much, you'll, um, you'll start to get what looks a little bit like a, like an edge there. You can, you can kind of barely see it. Maybe if we turn on our cavity and our, turn those up. No, I can't really see it too well, but, um, you know, there's a little bit of a seam there that I don't like. So, um, it's fine to leave it like that, but let's just bring that down a tad. And then similar, similarly at the bottom, um, you just don't want any geometry too close to each other. So this is mostly straight as we can see. And by bringing this down, we were able to kind of create that roundedness there. And here you can see a production of the subdivision surface modifier. So that's still a little bit jagged. So you could even crank that up a little bit more if you wanted, or of course, adding more edge loops will uh, give it more to work with. So I think that bottom shape looks pretty good. You know, maybe what I want to do is just scale this in a tad, just to kind of match the reference a little bit closer. But um, these references that I created are by no means any like scientifically accurate wine bottle or anything. Um, so, so don't worry about matching the reference too closely, but I did create those just for you. As you can see, we've got the nice, uh, the Dirk branding on there, Dirk KB, which we'll talk about in the, well, I think on Teachable, I was going to do a section where I talked about the label first, but uh, here I am recording the first part. I have no idea what I'm actually going to do. So uh, like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're on Teachable, then uh, let me know how it's going. I, I really want to start kind of making my tutorials more as like full courses. I think that that'll, that'll be more fun, serve you better, be a little high, higher quality, better experience. Um, so anyways, with that note out of the way, we need to add some thickness to this thing. It's not looking, uh, not looking so hot there at the top. I'm going to cut some lips up there. I don't want that. So I'm going to add a solidify modifier, which is going to turn it into a little chunky boy. That actually looks kind of cool. It's like a milk carton or something, but <laughs> it's going, uh, it's going out the wrong way. So I can make it go the other way with the offset option here, bring that the other way. And then uh, I can bring this thickness down. Now, if you just click and drag, it's going to be a little bit too much. So you usually want to, on pretty much any field in Blender, if you hold shift while you're dragging, it will allow for a much finer tuned drag. So I'm just going to bring that to something like that. Now, we're actually not really going to see the top because we're going to be modeling some foil on there. But um, for the purposes of the glass shader and things, it is uh, probably a good idea to have uh, this thickness here. So with that done, um, everything is fine and dandy until we go into our wireframe mode or our x-ray view. Uh, we can see that we've got this, uh, it's kind of like, you know, so this tight bend when it gets pushed out with that thickness is kind of creating this really bad geometry, um, which we don't want. So uh, the way we're going to fix that, we can't really fix it very well. Uh, just in the modifier here. So we're going to start applying some of these modifiers to fix some of those issues. So what I'll do first is press shift D and then X, and I'm just going to hold control. And that's, I'm just, I like to bring it out um, by, with a snapped increment so that if I need to bring it back into place, I know I can get it right back where it was. You can of course do that with other snapping tools, but um, that's just how I like to do it. And I'm going to move this bottle to a new collection, which I will call the trash collection which as I like to say, if you needed to get back in there and uh, step back a few steps, you wouldn't call it the trash collection. You'd call it the pat yourself on the back for uh, creating a duplicate collection, but that doesn't, uh, doesn't fit up here. So I'm going to press this little exclude from view layer button, which is going to hide that. And that's great. So now I have, the reason I wanted to do that is because now I'm going to apply the solidify modifier. So to do that, I'm going to press control 
A right here, and that will apply it. And I think there's a way you can do it. Yeah, apply right there. Uh, when Blender 2.9 came out, I think they changed something about the way you apply modifiers, and it was a little confusing at first, but there's a little drop down right there. You can apply the modifiers. So that's looking dandy, just fine. Um, it got a little bit rounded up there. We'll fix that after the fact. Well, we could, I guess, fix it now. We would want to just do what we did before and maybe add in a little bit of an edge loop there to sharpen that up. Uh, but we really want to do what we really want to do is fix this um, that whole middle area. And the way I'm going to do that, so I know that from this ring down to somewhere around there should be straight. But now we've got all this other crap going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press Alt and left click to select that ring right below. And then I'm going to press X and delete those vertices. And then I'm going to do the same thing right here. X, delete those vertices. And then now what I can do, so basically I've, I've kind of cut that section off. So now it should be its own floating piece of geometry, which I can hover over and press L and it will select um, linked. It will select the, that mesh island, if you will. And now I can press X to delete it. And then I just need to connect these back up. Um, so the slow way to do this would be to um, just do it one at a time around the outside. That's very tedious. That's probably what I used to do. I, in fact, remember doing that many times. And it is a waste of time. Because what we can do is select that ring and then select that ring. And then in your loop tools menu, which hold your horses, you're probably not going to have that. It is still an add-on in Blender. So you need to go to your add-ons and then go to loop tools and just check that box. It's not, you don't have to buy it or download it. It's automatically installed in Blender. It's kind of cool. Blender comes with like so many add-ons already, um, but you just have to turn them on. And I guess that's so that the software's not too heavy. Um, but yeah, loop tools, it's a good one. I definitely don't use it to its fullest feature set, but uh, for something like what we're about to do, it works well. So I'm going to go loop tools and that's just right clicking loop tools and then click bridge. And that will work wonders to bridge that gap. And uh, sometimes it might be kind of twisted or something. There's this little option down here that you can control um, whether or not that's twisting or how much it's twisting. So I don't want it twisted. I want it just like that, and that's great. So now, though, this is getting rounded over way too much, so I'm just going to add in an extra edge loop right there. And then I think I could probably delete that one if I wanted to, just for the sake of keeping things nice and tidy. Yeah, I think that looks good. So we pretty much have our wine bottle here. I'm pressing R twice just to do kind of a, a free rotation, uh, kind of inspect it, see how it looks. And uh, I think it looks pretty good. So what I will do now is just go ahead and take my background image because I'm all set with that. And I'm just gonna move it into my trash collection so that of course if I need it back, it's there, but it's out of sight now and I just have my wine bottle here ready to do a little bit more work with. So back on the topic of add-ons, we are going to use another one, but this one is also very simple. Um, by the way, you may have just seen me press shift C to snap my cursor to the center of the scene. I always like it to be there unless I need it somewhere else, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's nice to have it right there in the middle. It just makes my, you know, my perfectionist heart even warmer. So with my cursor warmly in the center there, shift C again to do that. Um, I'm going to add in my label. So once again, um, feel free to use your own label, your own aspect ratio, do whatever you want, design your own label. I encourage you to do that. But if you just want to follow along with the tutorial, um, the label file will be available on the Teachable course. And then I will also put it up full screen here for you guys to use if you would like to do it that way, screenshot it or something. Um, so what I'm going to do is press Shift A, and then just like we added the reference image earlier, uh, we want to use images as planes. Now similarly, that is, I believe, still an add-on. So you need to uh, search for it in the add-ons field, and then search for planes, import, export images as planes. So uh, what that will do is basically it'll take an image file and just bring it in, automatically apply texture, make it the right aspect ratio and yeah, do all sorts of good stuff. So press Shift A, image, images as planes, and then I'm going to navigate to where I have that texture, which for me is going to be a label underscore 
call, which is going to stand for color. So we won't see that it's been applied here, but if we were to go to our rendered view or to our preview view or to our solid view with textures enabled, you would see that uh, the texture has been cor correctly applied. It's the right aspect ratio and everything. Um, but it is a little bit large. So again, keeping this scale set to one, which is what you typically want for objects. I can double check here. That one is one as well. We want to scale this down though, but I'm going to do that in edit mode. So tab S to scale it down. And I'm just going to guesstimate sort of right now and then tab out and see that this scale is still one and it's a little bit closer to what it needs to be. So that is just fine. So now I played with several ways to wrap the label around the bottle, but the simplest method I found was going to be to actually add in a curve object. So I'm going to press shift a add curve and make that curve a circle, a uh, bezier circle or nerve circle. I don't think it really matters. Um, but yeah, with that in there, what I'm going to do next is um, I basically want to use that circle to wrap this label. Now the problem is if we add in the curve modifier, which is, you can go ahead and do that. Um, the curve object, since we only have one curve in the scene, it'll just be the only one in that list there. Uh, but you of course could rename this. Probably a good idea to actually name some of these um, objects right now. So I'm going to press F2 and name that. Let's, what do we name that? Like wrapper curve or something? Yo, my name's Curve. I'm the hottest rapper. <laughs> that was so bad. Okay, so anyways, once you named it, whatever you name it, Rapper G, Young Slim, Curve, whatever you want to name it, um, it's not working. It's just not working. So you need to press Tab to go into Edit Mode on the curve. The reason is it's trying to curve like these four points around the entire bottle, which as you can imagine, just doesn't work. So you need edge loops. Same thing we did before. Control R. You'll see that little yellow line up here. And then what you can do is scroll up. So I'm just going to scroll way up, way, 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 way up. Keep scrolling. Get plenty of them in there. Nice and curvy. Boom. That's good. And then just left click. It allows you to slide it, but with this many, there's not much sliding to do. And then right click, and that will complete the command. So now we have an absurd amount of uh, division right there. Now, if your bottle is gonna be like bulbous or like some other weird shape, you might need to add some um, edge loops that direction too, but uh, we're not gonna do that. So now that's looking good. Um, now the only thing is it's not curving the right way. So I'm gonna go into the curve modifier and change the deform axis. Uh, curves are a very confusing thing. They just don't do what you want them to do. Um, so you just need to kind of click on all the options. That's a lot. If you know what you're doing, it probably works perfect every time, but I don't know what I'm doing. So uh, I just like to try a few. So that's fine. Uh, it's okay, you know, but it's obviously, it's too big. It's flipped around the wrong way. So I'm gonna, you know, but it is curving mostly how I want though. So I'm gonna go into the, curve object, tab, press A to select everything, and then R and X, and then let's spin that around. Don't think that did what I wanted. Actually, that did something I wanted, because you can see this is backwards now. It looks like Russian or something. Spin that around, and now it's correct. So I'm holding control, and then up there in the top left, I can see it's rotating 180 degrees, so that's good. I think you could also control this with the tilt. I should have just done it with the tilt. Anyways, now I can rotate this on the Y axis and then the X axis. Oh gosh, this isn't really working out for me, is it? I need to do the tilt. Okay, so that worked. And then maybe like S, X, Y. Okay, that worked. S, Y, negative one. So yeah, you'll need to move your curve around just, you know, you want to keep it a circle. So if you're going to scale it on an axis, you know, hold control, make sure you do just exactly negative one. You can change this tilt here to flip it around. Um, just get it in the right orientation. I think I could have also moved the label object, but um, really I want to just, I want to do the changes ideally within the curve. Um, now, one thing I will note is I made a point of 
you know, pressing shift C to make sure my cursor was in the middle. When I added that image, it got it added right at the cursor. And then similarly, when I added the circle, it got added right at the cursor. And you want that to be the case. You want the origins to be on top of each other. You can see if they aren't, um, weird things will start to happen. So now I want to be sure I'm moving these objects together when I position them. So I'm pressing G and Z and bring that up. And you know what? If you just move the curve in edit mode, okay, that appears to work. So it will move it to where it is. I gotta say, curves in Blender have always been not a strong suit for me. They can be very frustrating. I'm sure they will be frustrating for you as well. Just take a walk, you know, chill out a little bit if the curves are getting to you. Um, yeah, they're, they're kind of annoying sometimes. So press tab, go into edit mode. I'm just gonna scale this in until it wraps the bottle just the right size. You can see this is where having that straight is ideal. And I'm just gonna get it until I've got kind of that weird glitchiness because um, that tells me that it's overlapping properly. So uh, now what I'm gonna do, I can see that it is much too tall. So I'm gonna press click on that and then tab to go into edit mode and then A to select everything and then scale it down a little bit and then tab out, check it. Um, but if you don't wanna tab in, tab out, you can just tab in and then there's a little button here for display modifier in edit mode. Um, so you can click that and then you can just watch it as you do it. So I'm just gonna get that to right about there. And then let's move them both up together again, GZ. And I think that's pretty good, uh, depending on, of course, how much you want it to wrap. This comes a little bit down to preference. Kieran was uh, was telling me where it should sit. I should probably check my reference there. Um, might as well check my reference there, right? Let's see if we can find our. Bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. Look at all my files. I've got so many files. Dropbox, Dirk, Doyle, Wine. I'm singing a song. Check my reference. Just want to check it all right now. 3D test render. And the most recent render would have been this one. Looks like we're, uh, yeah, something like that. Maybe a little bit up, a little bit small, a little bit of a gap. I just want to get it right uh, because I tend to like to use the exact file from every part of the tutorial in the subsequent parts. So there's no smoke and mirrors, nothing changes. So I'm just going to get that into about the right position. And of course, we can adjust it more later if we want to. So that's on there. That's good. Now what I need to do is add a little bit of thickness to it as paper does have a little bit of thickness. And we're going to do that with a solidify modifier. So you can see from the outline there, it went to the inside. So let's do the same thing we did earlier there. Flip that to the outside and then just bring the thickness down. Um, and even holding shift, I can't quite get what I want. So I might just type in a value. Let's do 0.05 centimeters, which would be like a half a millimeter or something. Who knows? I live in America. There, <laughs> that looks pretty good. Uh, now the other thing you'll notice is that these sections are a little bit larger than these sections we created, which why is that? Well, it's because the curve object actually has a resolution of its own. So if we select that curve object, you can see the preview resolution and the render resolution are two options. Uh, I believe, yes, if, if, it's, if the render resolution is set to zero, it will use what the preview resolution is. So 12 is not enough. So I'm going to turn that up to um, just a nice even number like 64. Should make it nice and smooth. And now those sections are as big as we made them. And that is going to be probably plenty of um, definition. You know, if you're going to get in insanely close, you might want more than that. But for our purposes, that's going to be just fine. So we can go ahead and right click shade that smooth, um, which is going to make this part look good. But then we've got kind of some weird shading. And that's because similar to the subdivision surface, it's kind of like trying to round something that, you know, wouldn't really make sense to be round. So there is an option down here in the normals called auto smooth, which will tell Blender that, hey, any angles greater than 30 degrees, and you can of course set this, should be sharp. So if we were to go above 90, which is about what those should be, you'll see that they'll get smooth again. And that's how that works. Very convenient. Honestly, the default setting of 30 usually works pretty well, but you may need to adjust that depending on exactly what you're working on. So 
but this is all together looking good. Next thing I want to do is add a little bit of a foil top. So we're going to do that by selecting our bottle mesh here, tabbing into edit mode, and then we basically need to kind of, I'm going to press alt a to deselect everything. We need to just get some of this. We're just going to steal kind of the top section of geometry and make a separate object. And you know, that will be the foil. So the way I'm going to select that is just pick somewhere. So I know I want from here, so I'm gonna do Alt and left click to select that edge loop. And then I wonder if I can do Shift Control Alt. That didn't really do it. Okay, um, I was trying to come up with a creative way to select that whole thing. There's like a million ways to select things in Blender and honestly, um, that's a pretty big skill is you know being able to select things the proper or fastest way. So. I'm going to press Alt and left click to select that edge ring, and then I'm going to do Control plus, 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 plus to grow the selection. And do we want to go maybe a little further down? I'll do Control plus one more time, and that will get a nice foil part. And we got this extra ring on top, which I don't need. So I'm going to Shift, Alt, left click to deselect that ring. So now we have a good little bit of geometry for our foil. So what I'm gonna do is press Shift D to duplicate it. Similar to what I do with the extrude, I just like to pull it out to see that it's there. Right click, we'll snap it back into place. And then with it all still selected, I'm gonna press P and separate that selection by, yeah, se separate selection, boom. Now, if I tab out of edit mode, you will see now we have another object. We saw the original geometry on there, of course, but we have this new object, which is going to be the foil object. So let's press F2 and name that the foil. And we didn't name this the bottle. Oh, gotta, get that, gotta get that capital B. Nice and fancy. I mean, we're making wine bottles here. We don't wanna be skimping on the punctuation, capitalization, something. Um, so the problem here is, you know, when the subdivision was applied, there was another you know ring down here kind of defining that curve we lost that so i'm just going to scale this out until it gets to be right about where i want it and it's okay if it's in a little bit because we are going to add a solidify modifier let's go ahead and do that and let's put that right there and do a little bit of thickness on it oops it's popping out the top so this is weird i mean you could do a negative thickness or you can change the offset to go the other way which is what i like to do so similarly here, let's just get like a 0.02 centimeters. And then let's also turn on our auto smooth option. And I'll tell you right now, I use that auto smooth option so much that I actually added it to my quick favorites. So by pressing Q, I can automatically turn on and off auto smooth without even being anywhere near that menu. To do that, if you're interested in doing it yourself, and you can see I don't have a lot of quick favorites. It's literally like the only quick favorite I have. I think there's one other quick favorite that I use in edit mode, which is the edge length. Sometimes I wanna see how long edges are. So what we're gonna do now is go through each of these dimensions and read them aloud. I'm just kidding. <laughs> quick favorites, don't use a lot of them, but you know, when you really, it's your favorite, you got to use it. So right click and you can add quick favorites. For me, it's remove because it's already been added. I love you, auto smooth. Q, auto smooth. Q, by the way, is how you bring up your quick favorites. And you can add like all sorts of stuff to your quick favorites, but I don't have a lot of favorites. It's just that, I guess. So I'm gonna press F to fill that in. And now since we, of course, have the subdivision on, it's gonna not gonna look so hot. So I'm gonna press I to inset and then Let's maybe press, uh, let's let's add an edge loop here, bring that up. So the foil's a little sharper around that edge. And now, unless this was like some crazy vacuum form sucked foil, it wouldn't be that tight in the corner. So I'm gonna delete the edge loop there, which will unround that, or it will make it round. And similarly, I'll delete that one. And that might be a slightly more realistic foil um, you know, or maybe you add it back, but you just kind of, you leave a little bit of, and you of course don't have to have foil if you don't want it, but I'm a foil kind of guy, I guess. I guess I like the foil. It looks classy. And now this, there would usually be like a cork right there. So 
I'm gonna press I to inset that. Or wait, I'm just gonna bring it down a little bit. I don't want it to poke through. I'll press I one more time. And then I'm just just trying to make a nice little indention there. Bring that up. There. That'll be very, very pretty. Now you do get some weird shading when you do something like that. So you know you can add more insets to kind of curb that. But um, it's going to be fine. We don't really see too much of that. So I think that looks good. Let's just uh, let's just keep adjusting things as I usually do once something is done and you should be moving on. I like to continue adjusting things. So the geometry is nice. Okay, so that's some pretty good looking foil. Um, that's about all we're going to do for the modeling. Um, I will, though, if you're interested, bonus, I'm going to model the little detailing around the bottom. Of course, you can skip that if you're a beginner. I encourage you to do so. It's more important to just work through a project and finish it than to get hung up on small details because um, we're going to get a, you know, it's like slightly more advanced, but if you were going to look at the bottom of the bottle, things like this would make the difference. So uh, we will uh, we'll go ahead and do that next after I make more small, pointless, fine adjustments, like getting that exactly. I want it. Oh, and I didn't mention if uh, if your bottle does curve out or you need to curve out, just use this tilt feature. Now, of course, tilt it in a straight line. If the form was much more uh, wild than that, you would probably need to use a shrink wrap modifier to get it where you want. But uh, we're not going to be covering that because our wine bottles today are mostly straight, and I think that they look just fine like that. So. We'll leave that section at that, and now what I want to do is move on to creating that detail down here on the bottom. So let's go ahead and do that. So to create that detail at the bottom, of course, there are many ways you could do it. Like with anything in Blender, you could do it so many different ways. But the way that I found that I like to do it was by adding in a circle with a bunch of geometry. So we're going to use maybe like 128 vertices to create this, which you can see that it got smoother, but you can't see those vertices until you go into edit mode by pressing tab, which is where you should be doing all your this type changes. And I'm just going to put this like right like there, I guess. Maybe I should bring it down a little bit so it's kind of sitting right on the plane. Bring it down a little bit. And this is another thing, like depending on the wine bottle you're using as a reference, it always looks a little bit different, but the one I like is what we're going to do because it's my freaking tutorial. So I'm just moving that up and then I press E and scale it out and then just move that down. That's kind of where they sit. It's just kind of like on the edge like that. So that is all good. Um, I'm just actually going to press G and Z and oh, that's way too much. I'm going to just like, I want to be able to see it better. Maybe I can hide this. Let's just for now. Uh, you know, we better not do that. Let's just move it up a little bit. It doesn't need to be snapped perfectly. I'm just gonna move it up so we can see what we're doing. And then what I will do next, I think what I did was I'm going to press, hmm, how did I do this? I've done it a set up. Like I said, lots of different ways you can do it. And I never remember which way I thought was the best, but I think what I want to do is select these edges and then press shift G, which will bring up a select similar menu. Now it'll allow me to select a similar length, which is gonna get everything. But if I turn this threshold down, it will create a more exact selection. So I had those two selected and it, it wants something that's exactly the length of those two edges. So it's not gonna be that, it's not gonna be that, and it's not gonna be that all the way around. So that was a way to just select all those rings. And this is where I'm talking about. This is like slightly more advanced because, um, but this is again, you know, I was talking about earlier how important uh, being able to select things in Blender is. And there's so many tools for selection and, um, and really the better you are with them, the more time you'll save yourself. So I'm going to press now control B to bevel each of those, which you can see that that is what that's doing. Um, if you scroll up or down, it's going to add geometry, but we're going to be deleting this, so uh, we just need it to be the one. 
Um, so get it something like that. This is basically going to be the space between each of those little bumps. So I'm going to do something like that. And then with them all still selected, press X and delete those faces. So now we have this little thingamajig going on, which looks great, sort of. Um, but it needs to, I think what I liked to do was add a solidify to give it some actual geometry now. And we can have it be something like that, ooh, ooh, something like that. And then I'm going to add a subdivision surface to smooth it out. And I'm going to end up joining this, I think, with the other object. So I'll end up applying the solidify, and then it will share a subdivision with this model. So it'll actually be up to three. And then I'm going to, which is why I'm making it so it's just these two planes because there's so many of them and it's going to get subdivided so many times. I don't want to overdo it with geometry on the bottom, but this really is kind of um, a detail that you don't necessarily need. So Alt Z to go ahead and grab any of these edges, and then I'm going to do the same thing Shift G and select similar length, which will get that, which, you know, this is almost exactly the same. And I bet if we turned up the threshold, it would grab those other ones actually grabs them at the same time because they're like similarly, this one would be larger. I don't know. It doesn't matter. We just need these ones. And then I'm going to press R. And if you do it this way, it's going to do it in the, the view you're looking, which that's pretty dope, but that's not what we're here to do today, Derek. Press R and Z and just create a little bit of a, a little bit of a twisted twisty there. And that brings us down into place, holding shift. And that looks decent. Something like that. Looks like maybe I want to bring the middle up a little bit. So that's what I still have selected. So I'm just going to bring that up a teeny tad like that. And then like I've done in the past, I'm going to press shift D and move this to the trash collection in case I need to go back and make some changes. Don't have to repeat all those steps. And yes, so that will be good. Now I'm going to apply that solidify modifier and then I'm just going to you know, I could delete the subdivision or leave it on. It doesn't really matter. Um, when I join it to this object, it will pick up the modifiers that that object has. So uh, selecting this and then selecting this and then control J and it will um, join those objects together. And now uh, that bottom object that I created has the uh, subdivision surface modifier that the wine bottle itself had. So we're all good. We may never see that, but if you do the details there, good for you. You are super pro modeler deserving of many, many freelance dollars. Um, now, another thing you could do that you're probably not going to see is like add some edge rings and then bevel them and then just kind of like scale things in and out a little bit. Just kind of create some a little bit more like variety down there. I feel like when you look at the punt, there's always some, always kind of some ridges. So that might look nice. Also pointless, but might look nice. And this, this little thing is really bothering me. A little spiky, spiky. Let's, uh, how can we get rid of that? We could like, we could just delete that face and then maybe we could use our, we could grid fill it. Maybe that would make it look better. Let's search F3 grid fill, which will fill it with a different type of geometry. Ooh. <laughs> We're going to control Z that guy. Um, I guess if I just moved it down a little more, it wouldn't look as obvious. I don't know. Let's just leave it. We're not going to see that. This is one of those things dealing with circles. I could control B to bevel it. I'm just kind of smooth it out a little bit. <laughs> now it's just, now it's just tinier. That's okay. We'll leave it. So I think we're pretty much all set on the modeling. Last thing I'll do to wrap this up is um, just create a, you know, we could probably apply that curve. Wouldn't be a bad idea. Maybe let's just, let's just trash collection it up. Shift D. Now when you duplicate an object with another object that it like references, the new object will reference the new object. So shift D. Let's bring that on the y-axis. Now I have two curves in my scene. This is wrapper curve 001, and this is wrapper curve regular. Still hasn't produced any music as far as I'm aware. 
I mean, how long has he been a rapper now? She even, who knows? Um, now is linked with that. So we're going to move those to our trash collection and I haven't done this before. So it's probably going to mess me up later down the line in the tutorial, but I'm going to apply that curve just so that I don't have this object to mess with. So I'm going to delete that curve and yeah, we should be all set unless we need to make any changes in which case we're totally screwed. And now is when I'll check that that's flush, even though I should have done that before. It's okay. It looks good. So we got our foil label and our bottle with our nice, nice detail. What happened down here? Why does that look a little bit different? Is that because I screwed with the darn? Is that because I screwed with the darn edge loops down here? Select similar area, G, Z. Bring those guys back up a little bit. Thank you. Please stay. Okay. Now what I'm going to do, press shift A, add an empty. We'll make that empty a cube and it's huge. Call that huge the cube. And then I'm just going to bring it up to a nice centered ish location about which I might want to make some rotations and things. I'm going to select my label, shift click my bottle, shift click my foil, and then lastly shift click my empty and then press control P and parent to object, keep transform. Now when I need to move around this bottle and reposition it, I can just move this one empty instead of having to select all those objects, which now up here in our collections, it looks like they all disappeared, but they're just nested under the empty, which I can call bottle controller. Enter. Looking snazzy, but now we have a bottle, bottle controller. So that's all fine and dandy for modeling. We've got ourselves a wine bottle. Hope it didn't take us too long. Probably did, but um, yeah, it was uh, it was fun. So hopefully you're enjoying things so far. Again, if you're watching on Teachable for the first time, thank you. I'm kind of splitting these up into sections a little bit more than I normally would, uh, but I think it's good for you. It's good for me. It helps organize things a little bit better. Uh, and of course, if you're watching on Teachable, you can see where you left off. Uh, but I will, of course, try to add the chapters and things like that on YouTube as well. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move into the next section, which is going to be setting up some lighting, more advanced materials and things of that nature. Thanks for being here. I'll see you there. OK, so here's the earth. I'm sorry. This is a wine bottle, not the earth. That was a reference to a very old internet video, which hopefully some people got um, round. This wine bottle is there goes the reference. All right, that's done. So what we're going to do now is light this bad boy. And we're going to do that with lights. You can tell I'm trying to collect my thoughts here. <laughs> what, I, what I like to do is uh, when I press one to go into the front view, I want that to be the front. So right now I should be looking at my backdrop. So I'm going to create that backdrop. Going up a little bit, shift A, mesh plane, which if you uh, were had your cursor centered, it should pop up right there, which is great, mine did. Tab into edit mode, scale this up a little bit. And then um, I'm just gonna select this edge and then E and Z to bring it up a little bit. And then I will press Control B to bevel this. And then scrolling up, create a very simple little seamless backdrop. Fun history fact, uh, creating a seamless backdrop in Blender was my first ever YouTube tutorial. Thank you to anyone who's been here that long. I'm going to right click and shade that smooth and double check that when I press 1, I will be looking at that backdrop. And I am. So that is great. Um, so now what I want to do is set my viewport up a little bit better so that I can uh, start working on multiple things at once. So I want to be able to have my scene view here, uh, but I also want another view where I will be able to work on materials and also see what the camera is seeing. So what I'll do is, first of all, click up here in the top right. And this has always been kind of a weird thing in Blender. Apparently it's easier now, but um, here's my mouse, follow it up to here, just kind of hover in this area and then drag to the left. We'll split out a view and almost all the time I like to have my render view down here, but since this is going to be more vertical, I'm going to step outside my comfort zone and this will be the rendered area and this will be the um, model modeling area. Uh, I will eventually drag down a 
shader editor into this sort of area, but I don't think I need to do that yet. So like I said, rendered view, we're going to switch this to a rendered view. Now by default, we are rendering in Eevee. I'm going to press N to hide this sidebar and uh, I will turn off my overlays with that button right there. Uh, so now I just have an unobstructed view of what my bottle looks like rendered. Um, now I am going to try to do maybe a small section towards the end of this on what to do in Eevee, but uh, for the purposes of this and what I really think looks, sorry, what I really think looks significantly better is to render this in cycles. However, especially if you're going to do an animation that may take quite a bit longer and depending on the computer you're working on, could slow you down. So feel free to follow along in Eevee, but um, at least for the next few steps, we're going to be doing this in cycles. So I want this view over here on my left to be my camera view, but I deleted my camera earlier. What a mistake that was. I'm going to press shift A and add a camera back in, which is going to add it right there at the uh, where my cursor is. Um, so now what I'm going to do is just bring it back, G, Y, and then just kind of G, Z. And then what I usually like to do to just get it looking straight ahead is, is just holding control and then I'll just mouse over these fields and it'll just snap it to increments. So the Z should be zero. X to be straight ahead would be 90. And then uh, similarly on the X, it should be zero. Y, let's go ahead and snap that to a nice even number. And Z, we can do uh, the same thing. It's hard to tell exactly what that's seeing though, because over here, I want to actually look through that camera. So I'm going to press zero on my number pad. And by the way, I probably haven't mentioned it, but um, when you're pressing hotkeys and things in Blender, it matters quite a bit where your mouse is. You can see if my mouse is over here and I press zero, it'll take that view into my camera view. If my mouse is over here, it'll take that view into my camera view. So um, that's one small thing that could be confusing if you're uh, starting out as, you know, maybe your mouse is over somewhere weird and you press the hotkey and it's not working. Uh, it, could, it could be something like that. But let's now set up our, um, since this is a, mostly a vertical object, and let's go ahead maybe and just add in so we can actually see what's going on here. Let's just add in our first light. Let's do that as an area light and just bring it up there. So now, now it's not just like this dark Thing over there that you can't even see what's going on. Let's make our aspect ratio the opposite of this. So let's do 1080 by 1920. And yes, marvelous. Now this would be, let's bring this in, just kind of get it in the right position. Maybe bring it down a little bit. This is a critical moment. This is where you decide what mood am I trying to set? Of course, you can change these things later as much as you want. So it's not that critical. Go ahead, wipe the, wipe the sweat off your brow. We're gonna make it through this part of the tutorial just fine. We want to decide some things like maybe the focal length. So is this an epic, epic bottle of wine? The biggest, the best you've ever seen. Do we want a very small focal length? so that our bottle stands tall and proud? Or is this maybe more like a wine ad would be, where you use something more more longer, like a 60 one, that I'm trying to get to 60, because that would make me feel better. Oh, there we go, 60. Is that what we're going for? Do we want to be down on the floor level, a peasant looking up at this fine blend? Do we want to be high in the sky, a seasoned wine snob looking down at this fine blend. The choice is yours. I think for me, I'm going to stop talking in that voice. And uh, I just want to be kind of dead on, just very understated. I mean, I'm kind of making a joke out of it. But seriously, like when you're look at reference images is one good place to start. But um, you can tell a lot about a product. And just, you know, you can really paint the picture with things like the focal length, things like where the camera is in relation to the object. Uh, maybe we want to look down ever so slightly at this. So that's something like that. And then let's just bring it in a little bit just to frame it quite nicely. So I think that looks quite nice. We'll leave it at that for the framing. And I have my viewport set up how I like. We can go ahead and add in a few lights now. Uh, it's a 
not a horrible idea. I was gonna say it's a good idea, but it's like it's not that, not that huge of a deal um, to do your lighting with not too much material action going on. It'll really help you to see the reflections, the shadows, and things like that. Uh, that being said, I will go ahead and set up a very simple material for the glass by clicking that, and then here, and then I did the little did the new button right there, which I think it already created one. So it's right there. I'm going to name that um, bottle as one would. And now I won't even color it yet, but what I am going to do is turn the roughness down so that it's nice and shiny. And I will make it a little bit of a darker color just so that we can, um, just so that we can see what we're doing a little better. We can see the reflections of uh, the lights that we're about to add. So this one right over top is not doing a whole lot, but I do think I like it. I think I'll leave it there. And oh my God, what is that bug? Why does it always happen to me? Um, sometimes when I scale the lights with the button, it gives me bad errors. Always a good idea to save your file if you haven't already. Um, I have saved when the camera was off. This is the only smoke and mirrors. So I saved the file, I didn't change anything else. So uh, I think let's maybe just move this over. Oops, G, X. Move that over there. And again, this is a good point to look at some reference images, uh, see what you can find, and just kind of try to mimic those. So a lot of the ones I see have this really nice sharp line going down one of the sides. Um, so I'm gonna actually use a rectangle so I can have a little bit more control over the size there and hope that that error doesn't come back. I'm going to save so that it doesn't come back or if it does, I'll fix it. And yeah, I'm just, I'm really, I'm kind of looking over here. I mean, this, this is the, this is the money is over on this side. This is just kind of moving things around. Um, but I'm really looking more over here while I'm working on this. And maybe I don't want this huge gap right there. Um, so maybe we can move this back a little bit. You have to move it pretty far before it comes up on the edge. I don't want it all the way on the edge. Um, but I want to wrap maybe a little bit more. So here I am going back to basically a square. And I just want to get a very nice gradient. Something like, maybe like that looks good. And that'll be a decent placement for my first light. You might consider uh, turning that up or down. Um, I also think I'm going to end up having this background maybe be black. Or maybe just for now I'll make it black. Um, so let's just do a new material. We'll call that the floor and we'll make it black. And it's it's a little bit shiny now, so we can turn the roughness all the way up, but uh, we may mess with those materials a little bit more later. Right now, we're really just focused on the lighting. So I've got that really nice highlight there. That might be all you want. You might not want any more than that. Um, but for me, I do want to add a little bit more interest and get some light going on over here. You can see, um, we do have some things happening and that's just because of our our world strength. So right now our world is this um, gray color, which believe it or not is adding light to the scene. Um, and in other tutorials, I've turned the strength all the way down to zero so that we're only receiving light from lights that we add and we have complete control. Um, but for this one, I actually think it looks decent to, um, to leave a little bit of world color on. You could use an HDRI if you really want some intense reflections, um, but in my experimentation, I found that just using this uh, white looks fine and you could leave it gray or for some reason I want it to be white and then I want to turn the strength down to like 0.1 or something just so that um, nothing is going to be completely unlit. We don't have any black and we're already getting a little bit of a nice gradient with that. Um, so what I want to do now is another thing that if you've watched my one of my tutorials before, you know I like to do is add a light. We'll add a point light, and then we're going to move that back, and then we're going to move it up. And what this is going to do is going to kind of create very natural. And by the way, if you don't want, my computer is using processing power to render around this as well, and I don't need that. So I can press Control B and drag, just drag over that window, and it will uh, snap that to the camera view. So now uh, I just have that one picture there. It's not quite so obstructed. Um, so what this point lamp does is kind of creates a little bit of a natural vignette. And if I bring the size of it, by the way, this happens to me on a daily basis. I am messing with lamps and I'm in the world setting and I turn the strength up and it's not doing what I freaking want. 
because I need to be in the lamp tab. Got to be in the lamp tab, Derek. That's what Blender tells me every day. Got to be in the lamp tab, Derek. I want to adjust the strength of this lamp. Bring it up in the lamp tab. Oh, dear viewer. Um, but now if I bring the radius up, you can see, and we'll look at it in this view, you can see that that would be like the size of that light. So the smaller it is, it's not really wrapping. It's barely wrapping that edge there. But what I'm going to use this light to do, besides create that nice natural vignette, is to um, create a little bit of a, what's that called? An ed edge light? Rim, rim light, I think? Something like that. One of them Latin terms I don't know much about. Not nah, that wasn't that wasn't Latin term by the way. That was Latin Latin term. Um, so we're gonna turn that to somewhere where we just got really mm, sexy little, just something like that. Maybe you can bring it down if you want to kind of wrap down that way. We got wrappers all over this file. We got we got the bottle wrapper. Still hasn't made any music. We got the rim light wrapping our bottle. We'll just call this tutorial a wrap tutorial. That looks pretty good. <sighs> Does it look good? I think it looks good. I think it looks pretty good. Now, a little bit dark over here on the right side. So I think maybe what I'll do is add in, I might add in another light. Once again, I can't remember exactly what I thought looked best here. So you can add in just another one of those lights. I just did shift D, but that it's just not very exciting. I want it to be a little bit more subtle than that, uh, which of course you could just turn the strength down. But one thing that I thought ended up looking pretty cool, and in all of my 13 years of using Blender, I never really did much of this until recently, but I'm going to add a plane purely to reflect some light as if we were like in a room or something. So I'm pressing tab to go into edit mode. I'm just gonna rotate this. Press R twice to do like a free rotation, which or it's like called like trackball rotation or something, I think. Trackball. Yeah there it says up there in the top. Trackball. Um, just to rotate that the way I like and it takes a little experience to know how to command that thing. But uh, yeah trackball. And so now I'm getting so I haven't added a light. I, all I've added is a plane but that plane is being reflected uh, in the glass there. And that's a really nice way to um, kind of create the semblance of like a room or something that this is in. Um, again, just little, little photography type details. Um, but now what I'll do is maybe E and X, like bring this over. Now, if you did want to come over this way, it's fine. Uh, you just need to change some clipping. You could of course move your camera in past it but easiest way is to in the viewport display you can show the limits and then turn the clip start up which means that it will clip anything before that you can see if i drag it all the way up to the bottle it'll start to cut through that so that's very convenient for especially if you're doing like an interior render or something like that and you know, you're trying to get like a nice big room shot but technically you would be outside the room uh, you can use that for um for that type of scenario but for me i'm just going to use it to poke through my reflector. Now, just for the sake of organization, I will add a material and call that the reflector. In case I did want to do um, you know, something really subtle, like, let's, for example, let's move this up a little bit. So this is kind of weird with the geometry, like the way the reflections work. You know, this would have to come sort of up a little bit. You know, maybe that like comes down. You know, just, it's okay to play with this. You're not gonna see it. Um, I'm just kind of trying to create some little bit of interest wrapping around the bottle there. So something like that. You know, that might look nice. Might also look totally ridiculous. It's up to you. I think it looks good. So that uh, that's fine. That's a reflector. Now, if you wanted to introduce a very subtle color, remember that this is... Ooh, let's shade that smooth so we don't get that. Um, you could introduce a little bit of color this way. Maybe you really want to tell the story. Maybe you're like me and as soon as you finish recording this tutorial you're going to go play Cyberpunk 70 2077. It's been sitting on your Xbox for the past 15 hours unplayed. So you know maybe you want a nice little yellow glow or something like that. Or maybe you're not a psycho and you want to just be a normal freaking wine bottle renderer and you just leave it white. Which is going to be me today. So that looks good. 
bring this up, bring this down, keep playing with the lighting. I'll try not to hold this up any longer, but for real, like this is the type of stuff you want to spend time on. I'm going to press shift D to duplicate this lamp. And, um, but yeah, for real, like just move things ever so slightly, keep tweaking it until you get the look you want. Um, so I press shift D to duplicate that lamp and then I'm going to press alt R and, um, you know, I might have turned off my screencast keys. I'm going to turn it back on for you. And uh, I'm just moving this light here. And this is just going to be a little light to kind of hit the top. So we will make that a square, though. Maybe we make that a disc. Let's make it a disc. I like discs. And then we can make it quite a bit smaller, perhaps. We might not need this. It kind of helps give a little bit of... That's kind of creating this shadow a little bit, which I kind of like. I don't know. We'll tweak it. Right now, we're just trying to get you set up with the basic render that you can show your boss. Hey, boss, I made a wine render, and you can just leave it at that. I'm going to save because I'm going to change this to an ellipse. I'm changing my mind again, and I'm going to push that button, which, sure enough, Crashed Blender. It's like the only thing that has ever crashed Blender. Good thing I saved. Let's open her back up. And let's open her back up. And let's window full screen back. Yes. Beautiful. Let's... Should we try it again? Should we try it again? No. Our knowledge would tell us not to. Blender, you're not making me look good. You're never buggy. Except for now. It's that that's like the one thing. I'm not kidding. That, that always gets me. It didn't do it earlier. Sometimes it does it. I don't I don't know if this light if I need it. Always a good idea to uh, turn off, turn on your different lights. See what's doing what. We can turn off area light, point light. Oh see, so that's the point light. I'd say we like that. Let's leave it. Here's the um, other light, the side area light. I think I like that. Now the top one. That's giving me... Okay, okay. It's giving me some heat right here. See that? I think I want that. Oh. So if that's it off, that's it on. The choice is yours. Is that doing something good for your render? I'm going to say it is. Um, but I think I want this to be maybe a little bit smaller so that that gets a tad sharper. So let's just kind of pull that in a little bit. Maybe should just left it a disc. Why does it need to be an ellipse, Derek? It's an ellipse. I like it. So that looks good. So that was a good little test. You know, it's not, not a bad idea to, to zoom in and kind of see where you're at with things. And then, boom, add that nice fat highlight. That's looking spectacular. You wouldn't even know that all this is is a solid black object with no wine inside it. So shall we move on to some more advanced materials now that we have our beautiful lighting setup. Don't forget to save. Control S is going to be your hotkey there. And yeah, let's set up the materials. So the first material I think I'd like to work with is going to be the wine bottle material. To get myself in a position to work with that a little bit better, I'm going to drag down a window right here, which I will make a shader editor. So clicking up here, I can turn that into a shader editor. And if you are familiar enough with Blender, or you do something enough times, such as myself, you would know that the hotkey is S. So when I need to make a window a shader editor, I just you know, say this was in the 3D viewport, I just boom, S. And you can see S is underlined there. So that's a, that exists like a lot of places in Blender um, where you see a little underlined letter. That's once the menu is open, if you press the hotkey, it'll switch to it. Small little tip there, but don't want to leave any tips off the table. Tip of the table, tip off the table. So we're going to do the bottom material. Now, right now, if you recall, it is just black with low roughness. Uh, I'm going to keep the roughness low, but I want it to be not black. I want it to be like a clear material. So to do that, I'm going to turn the transmission value all the way up. And now it is transmissive. 
And now I, would, I just want to check here. Light pass, performance, color management. Oh, for color management, it's not a bad idea to change this from um, no look to high contrast, for example. A lot of people don't like that, but I just, I'm, there's not like a single render I do where I'm not boosting the contrast a little bit. Um, I am a restrained man though. It's rare that I use very high contrast. Uh, I think if you were like a real live professional, spoiler alert, I'm not, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I am a professional. Um, I think if you were fancy or you, you cared more about this type of thing, you might do none and then leave it to your, you know, somebody you hire to manage the colors. But I just, I'm always boosting it. Why not have it come straight out of the oven right how I like it with some high contrast. So bump that up. But I was looking for somewhere down here. Oh yeah, caustics. I don't know if that would have been on by default or not, but I think you want those. Uh, I think my scene is set up relatively default, but it could by chance have been automatically on for me. But make sure that's on. And uh, yeah. So now, if I'm rendering something that's just clear, I would not want this huge light. And what that is, is that this point lamp behind it. You can see if we move that over, it goes away. But it is creating that rim for me as well. And we're actually not going to see it. Um, but in the light settings, you can turn off this multiple importance, which will still, you can see the light is still coming from behind, but it uses multiple important sampling for the light, which reduces noise for area lights and sharp glossy materials, as the tooltip says. That's all I'm making a tutorial is just reading the tooltips. Turn it on, turn it off multiple importance. Uh, I was tempted to turn it off because I didn't want that huge thing, but it gets rid of my highlight on the edge, which I need. So I'm leaving it on. And once we actually add the wine in, you'll notice that um, the effect is not nearly as severe. So we will be doing a small amount of uh, more modeling to model the wine. Um, but yes, so when you add any material, the base color typically is not fully white. If you want it to be a very clear bottle, you would want to turn this up to pure white. F, 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 one, 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 everything up white, super white. Uh, and that's a nice clear bottle, which if you were doing a bottle of rosé or something like that, you might want to leave that clear. But for me, I want the bottle to be green. So up to your preference and your reference. Wow, that was good. But, you know, what color is a wine bottle? You know, just find a green like that. Now, a little bit of saturation and a little bit of value goes a very long way when it comes to transparent materials. So um, I will turn this value down very slightly. And, you know, I'll turn the, I think I'll turn the saturation down too. Maybe the saturation is really more what I want to turn down. Just, you know, go grab a wine bottle off the, the street and see what it looks like. Then come back for part two. Just kidding. Um, so we're just going to kind of tweak this. Now, I do like to do it with the wine bottle empty just because, you know, that's maybe a, a familiar thing maybe you've seen before. Like me last night, I saw an empty wine bottle. Started off empty. That's all that happened. Um, so I'm just going to get, you know, the higher the value, the more like clear it will be. Um, so yeah, just kind of get this looking. I want to say names of beers that come in bottles that color, but you know, who knows what the copyright strikes these days. So I think that looks good. Something like that, kind of a pale green. And for those of you who just have to know, the hex code is 637856. And um, now I'm going to tweak it just a little bit so that it's different. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just torturing you. Um, okay, so we got the wine bottle there. It looks good. Let's make the wine that goes in the wine bottle. So what I'm going to do is press Shift D on the bottle object. And now we have another bottle object with no label and no foil. So for that object, what I want to do is create the wine, which is basically the inside. And we're going to use a similar technique we did earlier um, to kind of clean that area up to create 
um, you know, just the wine. So the wine would maybe go up to there and we can change this later, but let's delete this ring of vertices. So now we've separated that. So this is essentially that, that would be the wine that's inside of the bottle we're looking at. You can see that separation there. Um, and then we need to similarly on the bottom or just anywhere, I think, well, let's see if we press L. Oh no, I think since that was all one surface, technically, if we just press L here, it should select the whole outer piece. So by deleting one edge loop, we basically split the inside and the outside. So now I can delete all these vertices. And now we have just our, um, just our wine entered. Oh, but we've got all those things on the bottom. Let's, um, let's press the way I'm going to get those again, selection tips. I'm going to press L to select the wine and then control I to invert my selection, which is going to get all those. So X vertices, boom, looking good. Okay. So now that that is the innards. So what we need to do is just select this ring. And is this high enough? I think I want it to sit right below the foil. And you know, maybe my foil is just a little bit high. I want to press G twice to edge slide it up a little bit. And then I'm going to zoom in and just make sure that's in the right place. Okay. So edited the, eh, is that too short now? I don't know. It looks fine. So let's, um, so we can just, you know, if you had to add edge ring, you could, but I think right there is going to be a good spot for the top of the wine. Press F to fill that in. And then um, since we duplicated from that object, it has the subdivision, which I want to leave on. I want those all to match up. If you've got different levels of subdivision on the bottle and the wine inside it, uh, you could run into some issues. The easiest way to avoid that is to just apply the subdivision, but I'd like to leave it on. Um, so what I'm going to do is just, uh, with that edge selected, I can turn this crease option on, which is going to remove the subdividedness. Um, and then now for this object, which I don't think I had it on before, oh, not edge length. I'm going to turn on auto smooth. Yeah. And that will uh, sharpen that. So crease will, um, if you have use creases enabled, which is, this is in the advanced part of the subdivision modifier. Um, you'll see that there's that use crease option. So uh, what a crease is going to do is tell, uh, it's just a specific place where it's like, don't subdivide here. You, you can control the crease, but um, I want it all the way to one. So just absolutely no crease because that's just flat. It needs to be the top. Um, but I still do want the subdivision on because that's what's smoothing out the rest of the thing. So let's, um, let's go ahead and set up the material for the wine. Now, since the wine is also clear, also relatively shiny, I'm just going to uh, press this plus sign here to create a new material, which when you do it in this field, or if you did it right here, will create a, uh, a duplicate that has the same uh, data. So add a new material. It's going to be called bottle 001, which I will name wine. And for that, uh, we can pretty much leave all the settings the same. We just need to change the um, color to whatever color you want. So I'm going to be changing it to a red wine. Syrah, something like that looks fine. Maybe you want to spin it around the other way and be a more purple because like grapes are purple. I guess technically the color would be more purpley. Now for this, uh, we'll turn the saturation all the way up. I think it's going to look good. And then the value will bring down a little bit. You just kind of have to imagine what <laughs> a thing of wine would look floating midair. I think it would be a little bit darker. I guess if you've seen wine in like a carafe or something like that, or something larger, you'd have a good, good guess. But yeah, something like that. Of course, you know, make this whatever freaking color you want. You want blue wine? Have at it. It's all you. So I think this looks fine. I'm just going to tab into edit mode and then press shift N. Okay. Yeah, that did something. Recalculate normals. So because this was duplicated from another object and then I was messing with things a little bit. Um, the normals looked a little bit funny and I could tell that just because of the reflections were a little bit off. They seemed not quite right. So never a bad idea, especially on transparent objects to uh, tab in edit mode, select them all and then press shift N to recalculate the normals. So that's looking a little bit better. 
And now maybe I will turn this value down just a little bit more. Uh, so I think that looks that looks fine. We can always adjust it later. So GX, and then since I had held control earlier, we know that that's going to snap right back into place. Now, if I look here, zoom in, we've got a classic problem when you're creating a liquid inside a bottle, which is that since we made it from the same geometry, it is overlapping. So they're like exactly on top of each other, which creates, um, you know, basically zero thickness geometry or like doubles basically so it creates this horrible looking pattern um, and the fastest easiest way to remove that is just to scale your inner object ever so slightly um, if you do it inwards you get a little bit of a different look than if you do outwards i think outward looks better so if we scale in you can see that the glitchiness has gone away and it looks like that but if we scale it out just a little bit it looks like that what's the difference who knows so yeah, I'm just gonna I'm pressing S and then just hold Shift so that it's very small drag. I'm like pointing at the top of my screen as I always do, but in the top left of the window I'm currently in, um, you can see the scale. You just want that to be like just anything more than exactly what it is, just barely over there. And now I always tell you to do this in edit mode, but in this case um, I'll leave it in object mode so that if I for whatever reason need to get that exactly back where it was, I can just set that back to one. So that's good. We don't have those issues anymore. You can see a very slight tinge of red through here, which is I think kind of what I want. And uh, and we're not having that issue with the multiple importance anymore. You can see now even better that when that's unchecked, um, we lose those nice highlights on the edge that I would very much like to have. It just adds a little bit of, it's a little bit easier to see through right there. And maybe that's where you could go in and adjust your bottle color even more which for the perfectionists, there's the hex code. I can check it real quick. There it is. Five, three, six, four, four, eight. You can copy me exactly if you wish. So that's looking good for the bottle. Let's do, let's do the foil texture. It should be pretty easy. Let's do a new material, name that foil, and we'll make that metallic. But um, ching Now it's metal. So metal, bro. No one still has watched my metal material tutorials. I put so much time into those. So you can choose what you want here. Uh, I think realistically, let's go ahead and pick a color so we can see this a little bit better. Uh, we're gonna go for a little bit of a dark, dark red, which I was trying to tell you it's red. It's not orange. It's red, dark red. Why is this? This is looking too thin. Does that need to come out more? I feel like I want a little bit more of a thickness there. Should we bump that up a tad? Should we bump that up a tad? Let's just add a little. Well, there, I'm happier now. Okay, so that looks good. Uh, I think it needs to be, oh, man, this is really, I'm not looking at a reference right now. Not looking at a reference. Famous last words. I think that looks pretty good. We'll leave it at that. Adjust it as you please. I may adjust it later. Don't get mad at me. So this is looking, I mean, I don't know where you started. Maybe you followed the donut tutorial and now you got a fine bottle of wine in front of you, but um, it's, it's really coming together, I would say. So the next thing I wanna do is let's work with the label texture, that beautiful Kieran Black designed fine blend the 2020. It's been a bad year, but it is the year that this wine came out. And um, yeah, so it's gorgeous. Uh, I'll talk more about the label in the beginning section, which hopefully you've already watched, especially if you're on Teachable. You can watch the sections however you please. So we never actually looked at this material, but this is the material that was created when we use the images as planes. And now since the image, when you do the images as planes, there's something like options off to the right, which I always forget to look at that will like you can set it up to come in with a certain type of material, but I guess if you don't look at those options, this is what happens. And if it's a PNG, which PNG images support transparency, it will automatically connect the alpha into the alpha. Um, but since this is just a non-transparent image, uh, I'm just going to unplug that. I don't need the alpha value. I really just need 
that color value going in. So it looks fine how it is um, mostly, but since it's paper, the one thing I'm going to do is bump the roughness all the way up, or maybe not all the way up. We want a little bit of shine. We'll do like a 0.95. Now you can see if this was really low, you know, you'd have that reflection would carry all the way down. Uh, but I want it, I want it pretty high. So let's just take that back a little bit, something like that. And then, yeah, that's looking good. Now, when you're working with colors like this, I mean, it depends on what you did in your contrast and there's some other options. And then if your lighting is overblown, the colors can look bad. Um, but if you want a pure representation of what you were seeing in Photoshop or wherever you design the label, um, then I mean, for the purest representation, I would say turn specular all the way down, which means it just like isn't ex accepting specular light really. Um, so that's going to kind of take away some of the effects you'd be having from your lamps. Um, so I will typically, you really want to avoid turning that all the way down to zero because I think it's just unrealistic. Um, except for like, I mean, even well, everything I think has a little bit of specularity, but if you were doing like a, a very dark, very black rubber or something, you would turn the specular down pretty low. Um, but realistically with roughness all the way up, um, that that's usually enough, but I'll turn it down just a little bit so I get a better representation. And I actually learned this in one of my jobs when I was doing a lot of furniture creation, I was using a lot of custom fabrics, but sometimes to get the colors to look a little bit more correct and again this label really only has the um you know the one color to it so it's not a huge deal but depending on what label you're working with i'll go ahead and add this note but you can add in a color and add in some gamma and then usually just boosting the gamma a little bit can be the uh, fastest way to get your get your colors how you want them but i think they look pretty good here so now the next thing i'm going to do is add in another image to this label material and that's going to be the uh, basically the roughness map so uh, kieran and i created a separate map that is um, yeah basically it's the it's going to tell certain areas of this to be rough versus shiny and then we can also actually use that for the bump which is going to be a nice little detail so remember if this roughness is zero it's shiny and you can see that carrying down there and if it's one it's not shiny so obviously we don't want this to be all 0.95 or all 0 0.0 we want to control where that happens and so blender is asking us where does that happen well blender let me give you a map click this shifty and that's just creating another image texture i'm going to open which should navigate to the file where that one is and i'm going to do the label gloss now again, I'll maybe throw it up on the screen here for a second so that the screenshotters can screenshot it if you want to use that um, straight from the video. But again, if you're following the course on Teachable, this file should be available in this section or wherever I find out you can put it um, to download immediately. And I'll probably also upload this file onto my Patreon. So if you're a patron, thanks to those of you who are, uh, you'll have access to the file there as well. But or actually it'll probably just be included with the file it'll be packed into it but anyways enough about that uh, one thing i will say is that these are designed to be if i change this to an image editor you'll see that these are since they were designed in the same like software right on top of each other they line up perfectly so if you're taking a screenshot you might need to like you might need to adjust the uv slightly um, to make sure they work together but i'm going to change it back to a shader editor and now back to the add-ons topic um, you may already have this used because it's uh, it's pretty popular but preferences we're gonna turn on the node wrangler add-on if you don't already have that on you don't want to node wrangler and that's gonna allow us to do sh this little command which i do a lot shift control left click so when we look at this texture to preview that's what the shift control left click does is sets up that little viewer um, you'll see that this is the texture so uh, these areas are black, which remember corresponds to a value of zero, which means no rough, so shiny. And white is uh, values of one, which would be rough. So that is what we want. Um, so if we shift control left click to snap that all back together, and then we plug this into the roughness, you'll see that now we have, uh, it's going to be hard, we have to find a good spot for it. 
but somewhere around where could we check so there were other areas that were black like there is a is a shiny area you can see that and if we look down I'm trying to get a good I think I want to spin this whole thing around a little bit let's RZ oh yeah I forgot we got rid of the curve which is very convenient right now so where is that there you go so you can see see how that's shiny right there very nice detail fine detail if you will fine blend which can we take a minute and appreciate this label the default cube like dying it's so nice it's just so much story to it there's this beautiful text that i wrote on the back it's amazing amazing work mr mr kieran black did um so we've got our shininess working properly now like i said we don't want that to be totally shiny and we didn't want that to be totally one which is what it is now so something I would sometimes do with a color ramp, I'm actually gonna be doing with the new map range node. So shift A converter map range. And what that's gonna do, so it's looking for values from zero to one, which this image has black and white, and it wants to convert them to um, this value to this value. So right now it's not doing anything, but I want values from zero to one to instead go to, remember we had set it not quite to one, so we can pull this down to 0.95 or 0.9, whatever you want. And that's gonna make it so the label isn't totally um, rough. And then if we change this minimum up, that'll make it so it's not totally zero. So you'll start to see that that shininess will fade ever so slightly. So now we don't have that hard edge, not quite as shiny, just a little bit more realistic, maybe kind of feel a little bit like a rubbery texturized. Now we can use this same map to influence the normal. Now that is not gonna work out well because that doesn't really feed very well right into that. But if we add in a vector bump node and then we push the, uh, we put this color into the height, um, then it will be working properly. And now you can see we have a nice little uh, indent there and you could invert that to make it pop in or out. Um, now I will say this image technically is not, we're not utilizing any color data like we are with this. We're really just looking for black and white. So this should probably be changed to non-color. And you may see some small changes happen when you do that, but nothing huge. So this is maybe a better place to see that bump. You can see we have that really nice, it's almost like a, like a nice emboss printed on there. So that looks really good. Never a good idea, in my opinion, to leave it all the way at one. I always like to turn it back at least a little bit. And then, yeah, you could choose if you want that imprinted or bumped out. I think I like the bump out, and that's just with that invert option. So that's all looking uh, pretty good. We've got quite a bit more advanced bump texture, I'd say, going on there. The label looks a lot nicer than it did before um, when it was just brought in with the images as planes. So next last thing I might do, and this is just kind of a small extra little detail, is I do actually have a texture that Kieran also designed for the foil. So we'll go ahead and use that. And what I'll do is um, I'm just gonna click this principal share and I'm gonna press Control T. And this is with the Node Wrangler add-on enabled. You're gonna press Control T and it'll set this up. And that's just basically gonna add in that image texture node for me. And now technically we don't need these because we're just using uh, a UV, which is gonna be the default. But what I'll do is open that other file. So wine textures, and I have it a foil file. And it's not gonna be applied on there because it's gonna be looking for a UV map. So we need to add that UV map. And the way I'm gonna do that is by clicking up here, and I'm actually gonna mark some seams. So Control E, and mark a seam with that edge ring selected. So that means that basically, imagine taking like an X-Acto knife and slicing around there. So that's a relatively flat surface, so it should unwrap just fine. Let's take a look at that actually. And um, we can, well, let's just like grow our selection to that point. And so we'll do U and unwrap. Actually, I guess you technically wouldn't need to do that. But let's just, let's just get the whole thing unwrapped. Um, so I know I don't need anything. I just want this area down here where we're gonna, let's go and take a look at that texture. So I want the, I want the foil, 
to have this little icon on the top and then this I want down here just kind of on the on the neck of the bottle. So let's go back to our, I guess we can stay in our UV editor here. Um, so that's the UV we just unwrapped. I guess we could technically go ahead and place that there if we wanted to. Um, but we want to unwrap this other part. So let's create another seam. Uh, so control E and mark seam. Um, now, if you try to just, so we're really not, we're, we're not going to put anything there. So we don't need to really worry about the unwrapping. But if we U and unwrap this now, this is the bottom area. And we can actually select the whole mesh island here. So this is the bottom area. And the reason is, is imagine, you know, so anywhere that where there's loose geometry on the bottom, that's automatically going to be a seam. And then we added that seam. But uh, don't forget, you would also need to have a seam running up and down the edge. So I'm going to my edge select here with two. And then I'll just kind of, you know, basically slice down the back there. Control E, mark seam. Now when I unwrap, it's going to work a lot better. So here we can see is our top section, or is that the other weird section? That's the top section. So let's just get that into place, something like that, and just put that however you want it. Kieran has a nice message for you all. Wines at Adelaide are the best. So he says, I've never had wines from Adelaide. Maybe I have. Um, now this is that weird area which got unwrapped horribly. You can see if we like move it over here. And again, if you can't see your textures in this view, um, make sure you're in this thing. And also if you can't see them, make sure you have one selected. Sometimes if you have something else selected, uh, it won't display in the viewport. Um, so make sure that's selected. Sometimes that can create an issue. Uh, and you can't be in an image editor, you have to be in a UV editor. Those used to be the same thing. For some reason they're not anymore. Um, so I'm just going to move this. I'm just going to scale it really down to a white area. So I know that that's not going to be picking anything up. Now this one we want over here and we want it kind of like rotated, but it's not, it's going to be kind of like weirdly aligned. So it's not like perfectly flat, which is realistic because, you know, this would be printed flat, but then it needs to be wrapped one way. So you can just kind of eyeball it as one way. Um, but there's also a way you can, you can, let's just select this ring and this ring with alt click. And then we're going to do U and then instead of just unwrap, we're going to do follow active quads, which will try to straighten it out a little bit better based on whatever the last, you know, one is selected, that highlighted one. So you can see this has flattened it out a little bit better. And that's going to look nicer when we, uh, when we place that label. So it just, it aligns to the bottom a little bit better. Small details there. Another thing that if you're a beginner might kind of skip that because UVs are just not fun. Um, so this is looking, this is looking good. We can kind of just put that wherever we want, maybe somewhere right there. And of course we can always just rotate this object, the foil object around later if we need to point at a different angle. Um, so you'll notice though, we did lose our color. We want to add that back. Let's go into our shader editor and um, since I already had it set, I'm going to unplug this and then just hovering my mouse over here, another place where mouse position is important, I'm just going to press Control C and then that will copy the color. And now what I'm going to do is add in a color ramp. And now if we remember correctly, the white was the outside area, so yes. Now I'm going to press Control V to paste that color. And now that we have our color successfully added, we could drop this color ramp in the middle of these. So plug that color, which is black and white. And the color ramp works similar to a map range, but with color instead of just value. So that was going from black to white. Now we're telling it go from black to red. So you'll see what effect that has if we plug it in. Looking very nice. And now you could have some control over the, uh, the colors here. So maybe I want this to be a white color, or maybe I don't want it to be a color at all. And I just want to use this for the bump map for example. So we can plug this into the normal and then do vector bump and plug that into the height. And now you can see we have just a nice little impression there. And we could bring that down. Just a, a small detail and emboss. And then that's doing the same thing up top. Very nice, very classy. Extra little detail, go the extra mile. Um, now do I want to add the color back in? I might. 
or maybe I just make it like a, I should saw that color copy control V. Maybe I just bring it up so that it's a little bit like darker. Just kind of, just so it's a little more visible, but so it still has that bump. Yeah, I think that looks really nice. So that's about it for our basic uh, materials setup. Uh, actually, wait, there is one more thing that I did want to do, and that's to um, just break these lines up a very little bit. So if you think about the way a glass bottle is made, glass starts off um, like molten as a liquid, and then when it cools, um, it doesn't stay necessarily perfectly straight. Of course, in some settings it does, but I think in the case of making a wine bottle, there would be a little bit of ripple um, so the way I'm going to create that little bit of ripple is with a texture and we'll use a procedural noise texture for that. So similarly, like we did earlier, is we selected this principal shader, press control T, which will add in an image texture. And it's when it's when you see that pink, that means it's looking for a texture and I can't find one. It just uses pink because it's a very uh, obvious to see color. But I want this to be plugged into the normal. And then, of course, we're not going to use an image texture, so we can select that, press shift S, again, I think that's a node wrangler hotkey. Shift S, switch that texture to a noise texture. And then now it's looking for a UV map, which this is not UV mapped, um, but we don't need to use a UV map here. We can just use this object input, and which will do that. Let's go ahead and add in our uh, bump so that we can see that how this is working. So with the bump in there, you can see that is the noise texture. It's kind of creating that ripple, obviously way too extreme there. Um, you could change the scale up or down depending on what you like, but I think leaving this very subtle, maybe like a scale of three or something looks nice. And then let's go back into our front view here. And then, sorry, our camera view. And then we'll turn the strength on this pretty far down. And you could maybe even, let's leave the strength up while we look at this, but you can add a little bit of distortion, which will just kind of make it like more ripply, if you will. Um, so let's maybe turn that to like, a, I don't know, just turn it up a little bit. 1.5 is probably fine. And then the strength on this bump, I'm going to turn really far down so that it's very slight. You, and here's another node wrangler thing. If you press uh, on this bump here and then press M, it will mute it. So it's like it's still connected, but you can see what it looks like without it. So there's it on and off. Just adds, you know, some very slight variance there. Maybe you think that's a little bit. Um, too much, too little, you can adjust it. You know, if we change the scale up too much, even if the strength is really low, you'll still see it. Um, so I'm going to leave it. Maybe we'll turn it up just a tad. Something like that. And maybe we'll bring it back a little bit. This should be a very subtle effect, but I did want to uh, leave it in there just so that you could see what that looks like and um, just an, an extra little detail to kind of give yourself some realism. Sometimes, you know, if you're doing like a Photoshop mock-up or something, it might be missing things like that. So, you know, we're going through all the effort to, to model this thing up in Blender. Might as well do it right. Um, now, did my wine... Okay, so my wine is in there. So I'm just pressing R twice to kind of do a free rotation. Take a look at that beautiful bottom that I ignored earlier. Uh, and now with that empty, I let go. I can press Alt-R to uh, snap that rotation back to how it was. But yeah, just press R twice and you can kind of spin things around, take a look at it. And uh, yeah, I think that pretty much covers it for the materials, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so what I'll do next is just go over some settings that we would maybe use in Eevee to maybe make this look a little bit better. And then also, um, you know, just setting up a render so that we can actually take this and save out the image, take it to our boss, show him what we did. And, uh, and yeah, so th this would be, you know, technically a, a pretty good stopping point, especially if you're a beginner. Um, now I may be adding some animation later in the tutorial as well. Stick around for that. But um, yeah, we're pretty much all set up here. If you know how to render an image, you're free to leave at this point. Thanks for being here. Go use the bathroom, take that walk. I think I'm about to go take a walk. And uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Like and subscribe. Stick around. We'll, uh, we'll be doing some more in the next part.